Oh, everybody, <clears throat> I'm sorry for missing yesterday, so I'm going to do two videos today. We're going to do the um, repression, or suffering one and two, and um, ecocide um, right now, and then in just a little while, I will upload the... Uh, uh, our, is it our temporary supervisor? <sighs> yeah, our temporary supervisor. My mind is everywhere right now. All right. So, um, the bit we're going to be doing today in um, Conspiracy Against the Human Race um, is kind of the thing that hit me the hardest the first time I read this. Um, and I'll let you know what that is when we get to it. But, um, in repression, um, you don't realize how much you do it, um, until you hear this, like, set out for you. Um, but, uh, so this starts off, um, quoting Zaffa again, um, the whole of living that we see before our, our, before our eyes today is from inmost to outmost enmeshed in repressionable, repressional mechanisms, social and individual. They can be traced right into the tritest formulas of everyday life. Um, and it, when you first read that, you're like, oh, well... Um, but the more you think about it, the more you realize how much you have to repress stuff. And, like, it doesn't talk about it in here, but even, like, people who, like, do, like, little mantras or, like, um, anything. Like, I th like, I don't know how this popped in my head, but <clears throat> the movie American Beauty, if you've ever seen that. That whole movie, every character in that movie is re dealing with repression. Every single character. Whether it be the um, gay military guy, whether it be the mom saying, like, I will sell this house today. I will sell this house today. You know, like, um, every character in that is, like, constantly repressing and trying to um, create almost a different reality to be able to deal with the, um, suffering of their life. I mean, even the main character. Um, so let me see what else did I want to read out of this. Um, once the facts that, uh, repressional mechanisms hide are accessed, they must be excised from our memory our new repressional mechanisms must replace the old so that we may continue to be protected by our c cocoon of lies. C -c 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 cocoon. Um, and one of the examples in here, it's really good. It's actually a couple. Like um, the doctor says... I'm afraid you have an inoperable tumor and haven't long to live. The patient says, that can't be. I feel in perfect health. Um, the police officer says, I'm sorry to inform you, ma'am, that your husband has been involved in a vehicular misadventure. He's dead. Then the wife says, that can't be. He just left the house ten minutes ago. And then given time, um, you learn to accept those things. But um, it's kind of like a gut reaction to protect us. Um, that our, our minds just automatically do that so we don't go crazy. But then you start thinking, like, if that's, like, kind of the go-to um, thing that our brains do... Like, why would our brains do that in the first place if not everything that we go through almost daily is something 
that we need to repress, if that makes sense. And that goes into suffering, which we're going to be talking about right now. Um, so there's a few things that I want to hit on here, like right off the bat, but, um, for almost all philosophers who write about death, the subject is studied in the abstract with the unsightly tangibles at its bedside, either bracketed or shrugged off. If dying is even given the time of day by philosophers, it must be studied as a subcategory of suffering the meaning of. Um, and this is kind of like a big thing because when you think about it, anything you've read about death or, um, even in like religious texts, when talking about death, it's always the exact death. It's not the suffering that goes in with dying. It's like just the thing. And then what happens after? Um, most people, most books, most religious texts do not talk about um, the pain and the awfulness of suffering and how long um, that suffering could last. Um, and then this goes into more detail about how we as a species spent our whole lives trying to make sure that we could live longer. And that is almost the, um, not epitome, but like the, the goal of life is to procrastinate death. If that makes sense. Um, just even in the last hundred years, like our lifespans have increased, um, greatly, Whereas, um, every other creature there is, um, nothing has changed for them, but we take pride and we, um, get excited, um, about shrugging off the inevitable, I guess, by, um, our advances in medicine and things like that and what's healthy and what's not healthy and, um, all this other stuff, but at the same time, it's like, it's just prolonging the inevitable, which is fine if that's what you're into doing. Um, but then we start having to ask, why is that so important? Um, and stuff like that. Um, as a survival happy speed. Oh wait, no, the rest actually, I wanted to hit this part too. Um, the pessimist credo or one of them is that non-existence never hurt anyone and existence hurts everyone. That is seriously like the heaviest fucking shit in this book. And it has been said numerous times in different ways, but that is seriously the deal. Like non-existence has never hurt. Like that doesn't hurt anybody. That doesn't change the price of tea in China like nothing from a non-existent standpoint puts anybody in any pain. Whereas just existing causes everyone suffering. Like there is not a single person who doesn't suffer. And whether it be you're freezing cold one night, you're starving the other night, your heart is broken, um, your mind is broken, um, you broke a bone, like there is just constant suffering, worrying about bills, worrying about, um, things at work, uh, worrying about if that person's going to love you back, yada, yada, yada. It's just constant suffering. Um, and as a survival happy species, our successes are calculated in the number of years we have extended our lives with the reduction of suffering being only incidental to its aim. So <clears throat> this goes along with a lot of stuff like, um, even, and I'm sure some of you know what I'm talking about here. Like 
um, people who have cancer and have to go through, um, hang on, have to go through uh, chemo and stuff like that to extend their life. Um, they're not getting rid of the suffering there. They're just extending the life. And hopefully, after all of that, everything will be fine. Um, but you will still suffer. So, um, it's funny because I was about to say it's kind of a pessimistic way of looking at things, but it's true. Like, no one can say that, like, suffering doesn't exist or these things that happen to prolong the inevitable, like, help with suffering. Um, and I mean, shit. Just go to a fucking hospice if you want to see um, fucking suffering. Good shit fucking God. Um, but anyway, so then we start talking about ecocide. And this, I've read this passage so many times. And just in the last like two days, I probably read it like 15 times. And this morning, I had this like thought that like kind of blew my mind and like opened it up. And now I'm like, shit. Like, I don't know if I could ever put all that stuff back. Um, but this line here is the line that when I first read this book, um, floored me and I had to put the book down. Um, and I thought about it for like a week before I picked the book back up because it, it just mind fucked me. I don't know a better way of saying it. Um, no, I'm trying. It's not all this other shit. It's like just this little line. So basically it says, um, a capital crime in reverse, just as reproduction makes one an accessory before the fact to an individual's death. That knocked me on my ass. And I think if you go back and look at the video that I did when I first read this book, um, I kind of hung on that. Um, or maybe it was just me telling you I was reading it. And um, But just the idea that by me procreating and having a child... I'm an accessory to my child's death. Like, that fucking just killed me. And it's fucking 100% accurate. You know, like, um, it just hurts because, like, I get so emotionally upset every time anything negative happens to my kid. And to think that me, with all of this love in my heart for my own child, um, is an accessory to my kid's death. Like, just even saying it, like, fucks me up. It just, like, really um, hits. So that's why when reading this book, the best way to look at it at is just talking theory. You know, I'm sorry that the camera keeps shaking. This desk is not very stable. But, um, yeah, because if we start, like, internalizing everything this book says, um, you will probably want to take a step off the tallest bridge you can find. Um, so that fucked me up. But the thing that fucked me up today... <laughs> It's talking about, um, I wonder if I should just read this whole fucking bit right here. I'm going to read this whole bit. Um, we did not make ourselves, nor do we fashion a world that could not work without pain and great pain at that with a little pleasure, very little to string us along a world where all organisms are pushed by pain 
throughout their lives to do that which will improve their chances to survive and create more of themselves. Left unchecked, this process will last as long as a single cell remains palpitating in this cesspool of the solar system, this toilet of the galaxy. So why not lend a hand in nature's suicide? For what, for want of a deity that could be held to account for the world in which there is terrible pain, let nature take the blame for our troubles. We did not create an environment uncongenial to our species, nature did. One would think that nature was trying to kill us off or get us to suicide ourselves once the blunder of consciousness came upon us. What was nature thinking? We tried to anthro... anthro I could never say that word. Anthropomorphize it, to romanticize it, to let it into our hearts. But nature kept us kept its distance, leaving us to our own devices. So be it. Survival is a two-way street. Once we settle ourselves off-world, we can blow up this planet from outer space. It's the only way to be sure its stench will not follow us. Let it save itself if it can. The condemned are known for the acrobatics they will execute to wriggle out of their sentences. But if they cannot destroy what it has made, and what could possibly unmake it, then may it perish along with every other living thing it has introduced to pain. Okay, I'll stop there. Um, the thing that fucking blew my mind here was the idea, like, when we get off world, let's just blow the fucking planet up. And then it started making me think of nature, and if nature is a, um, nature in a sense of a being, if nature is just earthbound, let's say, and some of you will say, well, no, because, you know, science proves that things outside of, like, that a lot of things still work outside of Earth, outside of Earth's gravity. But let's just say for a moment that it doesn't. If we blow the Earth up and, in a sense, destroy nature, kill nature, will our suffering cease? Will the constant state of entropy that we've all been in since the dawn of time, um, will that stop? Like, without nature as the linchpin, what changes would be made to our eternal suffering? Does any of this make sense? It just, like, blew my mind, and I was like, fuck. Like, um, maybe we should blow up the earth. Because my, my whole thing has always been... <clears throat> the sooner we blow all of ourselves up and kill the entire human race, the earth will be fine. The earth, even if we do fucking nuclear fucking winter, you know, and everybody's gone within a certain amount of time, the earth will be back to normal. The earth will cleanse itself. The earth will be, um, vibrant and full of some sort of life. It will happen again, you know, <clears throat> um, humans are the catalyst for the earth dying. Um, and that's always been my thing. But now I'm like, fuck, fuck, let's blow the earth up and see if uh, anything changes. Like, any metaphysical and physical shit, like, fucking is different. Like, that'd be a trip. So anyway, um, that's my meanderings um, about the conspiracy against the human race. And again, um, in just a little bit, I will be uploading um, our temporary supervisor. So I um, hope you're enjoying this. Let me know down below what you think. And um, stay safe and try to stay happy, everybody. See you later.